two friends, Philip Moultrum and Matt Moultrum, uh, woodworkers extraordinaire. We've been friends for a while, and um, they are the second and third generation in the three generations of woodworkers. Their father, Ed Moultrum, started this. Interestingly, um, Ed uh, was an architect, designed part of the Library of Congress and a number of buildings around Atlanta. They're all there from Atlanta. Um, and then became a wood turner. And Philip was a lawyer and gave that up and decided to go into wood turning. And Matt got his MBA in finance from Georgia Tech, and then he decided to go into wood turning as well. And this family is the pioneer in an artistic form of woodworking that hadn't, it, it really existed as an artistic form. They've been highly successful. At least one generation is represented in pretty much every major museum in the United States. In the Smithsonian, they are the only three generation artists that all of them, they are represented there in the Smithsonian. And, and uh, they are in the uh, embassy art program with the State Department uses their art around the, around the world. Um, oh, um, about a year ago, we, we started arranging this a year and a half ago, and so I talked to Matt about, and he brought up to me, well, maybe we could do something with some Spring Island work. So we gathered Spring Island wood, and Mike Murphy took it up to them, and they have created a number of pieces that are unique because they are made from Spring Island wood. And if you haven't seen them, there's still a few available over at the Goth House. Uh, I think there's some extraordinary pieces there. They also have their book available over there. So without further ado, Matt and Philip Moulton. Thank you very much. Sure. Now, we're, we're this kind of goes through. This, this kind of is, shows you how we actually work, how it's done, and the uh, you know, steps, and what it's like to be in the in the studio working with us. So, and at the end, we'll be doing some questions. You have to take your questions. So, if you see something you have a question, we'll take it at the end here. So part of this presentation is about process, how we create, because um, uh, and then we've weaved in examples from the trees that we got from Spring Island, and um, over here, two examples of tulip poplar that are from Spring Island. Uh, but this is essentially what we start with. This is raw material um, <laughs> in our wood yard. This is what, and we'll use throughout the presentation, turning, which is our medium, um, is synonymous with sculpting. So you'll, we'll interchange that term. Before you move on here, one of the questions we get asked all the time is, where do you get your wood? You know, and some people think that maybe we take a chainsaw and go out in the forest and just, just slicing trees, and we don't do that for several reasons, besides probably not being the best you know, habit, but we're looking for certain woods that look, have the unique patterns or colors to them, and the only way you can see it is by looking on the ends of the logs. So we buy just about all of our wood from tree cutters who are on other jobs and tell them when they're on, on any job, if they find certain types of logs or trees, call us up because we want them, and that's where we get just about all of them. They bring it to us so we don't have to go get this. We're very discriminating. You know, um, part of it, the piece is only as good as what, you know, is a, contained within the law. And turning, I like to steal from Da Vinci, it's a revelation process. We reveal a sculpture within. And that's, um, you know, one of the biggest attributes to this. And um, you can see that um, uh, you start.
start with the raw material. We have one shot to best reveal a piece. Um, and I'll fast forward. This log here is that piece, the low flat piece next to my father. Um, that's what it, that's a Can spread you hold line. it up? So, you can see that's what we start with. We bolt the face plate on. We do face, you know, with uh, lag bolts and it's threaded. It goes on to our lathe. Our lathe and all of our tools we have invented and designed ourselves. And so, um, we have to create our own tools, our own equipment. Um, so let's say we, we have to we create our own problems, we also create our own solutions. Now these, these are the three main tools that we use. Uh, the top two are used just for shaping the outside of the bowl. And the top one is one my father came up with, it's called, it's called a lance tool, which is, has a cutting edge all the way around the whole top. And so you can cut with your left hand or right hand. So you have to actually, when you're doing this turning, you have to, you're using both hands. You don't just use one way. You have to learn how to do it both ways. The second one is kind of a commercial type of tool. It's a gouge bolter. And what we do is we buy the points and reset them back into our big handles. So we, our, our tools are about this long. The bottom one is a hook tool. And it has cutting the edge all around that curved hook. And that is only for hollowing out. So the, the hook part, the way it, when it goes in, it's cutting on the front. And then if you swing it around, it's cutting as you bring it back. And you're, you're pulling it around. And so that's used for just about all the hollowing. And this, that's the tool rest we use. And that's indexed, meaning that there's uh, we turn off a, a fulcrum and a point. Um, in traditional turning, they actually slide the tool across the, um, um, the tool rest. And, I mentioned tra traditional turning, think of like a baseball bat, a chair leg. That's, you know, um, in artistic turning, we have an open form lathe, um, which, or an open face lathe, which enables us to create open form. Well, we we can't turn spindles or, or long things because there's no bed out here to hold the extra the end of it. In this slide, my father's rough shaping a log. Um, and he's doing the outside form first, and then the inside is. Um, done second, and you can see how the tool works. How we pull from off of the tool rest here, wear a face shield. You know, that fulcrum point uh, keeps it steady. As Matt was saying earlier, you know, a lot of turning, especially when you're turning small things, the turners will use a tool rest like we use, but it'll be perfectly smooth and flat, and they'll hold it with their forefinger and their thumb and slide the tool. But when you're doing these big logs, that just won't hold it in place. And so what we use by using that index pin, it actually gives us a point to work off of and keeps it from sliding around and getting bounced around. And we, we can turn on any scale. So um, we've done really large pieces, architecturally large, but a human being can fit in them. And we do very small pieces the size of your fist. Um, each piece we use or each piece we create is only made with essentially two tools. So we don't have a lot of tools. This is um, very mm -hmm. simplistic as, as our approach. And that's the, the inside hollowing, uh, what we call the rough form. That's uh, the pieces are done from a log to essentially just a rough form of what the final piece will look like. That's where you can see that on the inside of the piece, we use a, a, an auger to bore a pilot hole. And that's how we start the, I guess the rough, or the uh, hollow, it out, right? yeah. the hollow form of the, the vessel. What is this piece of wood that you're showing? This one here is Fox Elder, but the true name is Ashley Maple. It's a maple family tree. Acer Nagunda is the scientific name of the tree. Um, it's very common in the southeast. It looks like poison ivy is a sapling, um, <laughs> but it grows into a mature tree. I mean, it's easy to identify in nature because it, when it develops a new limb, it's got a green, um, uh, they're, they're green coming out of the trunk, and so it's, it's kind of uncanny. But the red's very striking. So, did you know that was in there when you started? Uh, the yes, and that goes back like the first slide of all the logs. We look at the end of the log, and if you see this pattern on the end of the log, then the whole log will have that pattern. Mm -hmm. If you get a log that's just pure white in the end, you don't need to keep cutting because it's not in the end. It won't be anywhere in the log. So it makes it easier when you're looking like a big treasure load on log. You can go, I'll take that one, that one, not that one. You don't have to be doing you know, a lot of cutting to find it. And that's part of 
part of the approach for the artistry because you you're manipulating the material to reveal it and so you have to be conscious of that pattern and so you have one shot mm -hmm. and uh you know because that's part of the um the best approach to making a sculpture from that log and slide here is this is the hollowing tool we use to um remove material on the insides and it's extremely heavy it's so heavy that you really don't even hold it when it rolls in a stand right so you'll see Here's all the long tools you're seeing up there and over there with the hooks. Those are all for hollowing out the inside. The reason they're so long, here's the outside tools. They're much shorter because on, when we're using the outside tool, we can move our tool rest close to our work and have the right kind of leverage. But when you're hollowing it out, you can move the tool rest to the front of the bowl, but then as you go deeper, you're reaching and reaching. Eventually, you're reaching this deep, and you get the same kind of leverage, you have to have a handle say five feet long to get the same kind of leverage. So that's why this is so much longer and they're all steel handles. So they're real heavy and you couldn't hold that all day long. It'd just be too tiring. So we let that stand actually hold it as on wheels so we can guide it as it's where it's good that you can do it all day long and not have to hold that whole weight the whole time. How often do you have to sharpen your tool? Whenever they get dull. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the softwood, yeah, you go, you can maybe do three or four pieces if it's really, you don't get anything bad. But uh, real hardwood, sometimes, some, are, some woods are abrasive and they'll start dulling after a half, halfway through, you might want to sharpen it because you can just tell it's not cutting. So. Oh, but sometimes three or four pieces. Not you can. Four. Oh, okay. It, it depends. And, and some woods have silica. I mean, there's a density to woods. I mean, um, you know, novice form oak is harder than pine you know but um we've so had not pine. many times a day though or anything uh it, it depends i've had um uh, i've had wood um I, I most recently i turned ironwood and that was a punishment <laughs> <laughs> that's, that was, that's on one end of the that's like sometimes i'd go the whole day with just one sharpening and at the end of the day and the next day i'll have to resharpen it sometimes twice that's not any if you're doing like three or four times you're using some wood that's really abrasive. Or sometimes in the crotch of a tree, especially it grew close to the ground, it grew up and dirt got in there and it grew around that and you don't, won't see it, but it's just like cutting sandpaper on your point, you know, don't really that. And that, yeah, it's, this, this slide is that tulip hop, the Spring Island piece again that's here. That's the, um, showing you the progression of this piece or how it evolved. Um, and then that's what, so at that point, that is the rough form. Um, so, uh, I would, most pieces are sculpted twice, a rough form and then a final shaping. Um, smaller pieces are turned start to finish um, from a single, I guess, um, setting. And it has to do with the, the moisture because we, in, I guess, involve a lot of science with, with, with what we do because of the um, wood being a living material, it's full of moisture, and so it expands and, and can contract, and so we have to be conscious of that. Um, and there's the cracking and drying, so we have a, a process for it all. Well, most, yeah, most of the wood we use is has a lot of moisture. In fact, we can, the day it's cut, we can actually turn the bowl out of it. So we don't have to wait for it dry. A lot of people wait and use dried pieces, but we don't have to do that. And, but Why when, not? Uh, because we, we can go ahead and shake this like this, but we leave it like about this thick. <clears throat> and then it's got to be treated and dried, and that can be four months or five or six months. And then once it's dried, then we can go back and do the final cutting, as you'll see. So. And we don't have to treat all the wood. If, if, you, if you respect the, 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 the scientific properties of wood, you can go off center, the pit, and, and get a, um, uh, a better stable um, reaction in terms of the uh, when it does dry. Um, some woods we, we cure, some woods we don't cure, some woods reject curing, so it's just, uh, that's part of the, the science that we've developed over the years. Um, is, is cracking up, up in the drying process, is that a problem? It, it can be, um, and cracks are inevitable. Um, we treat some woods to prevent cracking, um, and some woods are just gonna split. Um, we incorporate cracks into finished pieces as long as they're not a visual impairment. 
So we don't want to be a focal point. And if it looks like the pieces glued back together, it probably was. And so we stay away from that. <laughs> this is um, so. All right, this is where we get a certain woods that need this. We'll soak it in our big water tub. We've got a couple of these. And it's, uh, it's water mixed with uh, polyethylene glycol, which is not candy freeze, which is ethylene glycol. This is what they use in hand cream and face cream and toothpaste. But also, what it, it's like a, when you see it at room temperature, it looks like paraffin wax. So it's kind of whitish, but it's sort of clear. It has no taste, no smell, no nothing. But if you get it warmer, like 105 degrees, it'll melt or put it with water and it'll slowly dissolve. But what it does, it, if you leave the piece of wood in there, it kind of sinks into wood. But after probably three months, it's not saturated. It's in about this far, which is just a little bit. But it's enough that when it dries, the surface doesn't shrink when it dries, so you don't have any cracking on the surface. How did you discover that? Uh, my father started doing this. He was reading a, an article in like Popular Science or something back in the 50s. And the government was trying to have this program where they had uh, used this to make gun stocks, like that probably during in the World War II, where they could do this fast and cure them. But then the companies were making this, were putting out samples to anybody to come with other uses. And that's when they started using the food additives and medicine additives and uh, they just, there's tons of other uses and they, there's not just one version of it. There's, they measured in the, in the, uh, in the chain link. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a polymer. So the one we use is thousand weight, but you can get like 50 weight. It's probably like thin as water up to like 50,000 weight, which is probably like a rock. And I don't know what they use it for, but somebody uses it for something. <laughs> And so, but if you find the right ones, it works for the right temperatures and what you're using it for. You developed a lot of useless knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, one of the things that they, they had uh, over in Sweden, this was 30 years ago at least, they found this old sailing ship from, I don't know what it was, 1500 or 14, called the Vasa, and it sunk. And when they located it, they were pulled up, they worried about it. Once the, all the moisture went out, this thing was going to collapse. And so they put it up in this cradle. And it's, and they sprayed it constantly with the same kind of concentration. And uh, that's how they preserved it. So. For three years they did that. Yeah. Yeah, they did. It, was, it was a slow go, but it's, you know, it's... it's... Some of the pieces we work on take five years to complete because we have to respect those factors of the uh, material. Really? Um, this slide, this is um, final shaping. And so we're, after the, the piece has been um, cured or dried, but at this point, the piece is completely dry and it's um, ready to be final shaped. And um, that's where the uh, all the curves are done and then the final wall thickness for the inside is done. And um, yeah. yeah, when we start in this final stage, remember the bowl's already been turned, so we've got about this thick. So you've got just a little bit to play with. You can't make a round bowl into this flat bowl. I mean, it's, it's not gonna work. But because they move a little bit when they dry, as long as you have that half inch to three quarter inch, that's enough that you'll get it perfectly around and still have a thick enough wall. So, and, so how it, long have you been creating this piece from the log? Like, uh, that one, uh, I'm guessing probably yeah, uh, eight months. But it was it was rough cut, you know, from the log stage, roughed out, and it was cured probably for a month or so, and then dried for like three months. And then once it was dry, I pulled it off the shelf and then put it back on the lathe and then did the final thinning uh, on the piece. And so that's what I'm doing here. Now, do you try to do a parallel negative shape inside to match the outside with yes. uniform thickness? Right. Well, actually, if you were to cut it in half right at the bottom, because these are secured on with some screws, so the bottom's going to be like this thick. Mm -hmm. And as you went up the sides, it would probably thin out and go to the top. So it's going to be a little thinner at the top. Okay. Pieces are thin so that there's a certain aesthetic to it when you feel it, mm -hmm. but it has to have a structural integrity as a sculpture. And so, and we do taper the thickness. Um, it's a nuance to, to our work. And it, so when, if you pick one up and set it down, you can feel that it's not gonna rock or roll or tip. And Is so that it has, a feel thing or a machine thing? Which part? 
um, having a uh, substantial base and a thinner wall? It, um, it's, what was the question? Is the thinness related to... Um, uh, how do you do that? How do you, how do you do How do you that? determine how big of a base yes. to put on? How, how oh. much do I need here and how... Well, a lot of it because I have here. big in diameter. If you have a piece this big in diameter, you're not going to have a base this big. You're going to have a base about that big. You just look at it and you'll know that is what it's going to take the whole... And then also visually, just is, is these... If you look at if it's too small, it doesn't look right. And if it's too big, it looks heavy and squatty. So if you have to you cut it, and you know, that's what you do when you initially cut it. You're looking at it and thinking, okay, this is just about right. And that's, you can tell, if you do enough of these, you, you can tell it looks right. That's part of the sculpting aspect to it, because I mean, we start with the log. I mean, there's no template that we follow. It's not like furniture, um, you know, and so it's, it's free will. Like also, is you, these are all, they're round or they're elliptical. And where do you put the high point and the low part? It's not just one lift. You can have more on the top and flatter underneath, or you have flatter on top. It's the, where do you want to move this? So it's all fluid as you're making this. But visually, as you're looking at this, certain shapes just go together right, and some of them just don't, they throw it off. They don't look, like I said, they look too heavy, or it looks, the base is too small. It doesn't look stable. They're just the proportions. What's that? I'd love to hear your narrative about what's going on here. So after we final shaped with the tools, and that's freehand, that's where we cut the outside, we thin the walls down the inside to their um, final thickness, we actually hand sand it. And that's a rotational disc sander that kind of levels out, and then we all we hand sand it from that point. And then at the next stage, we actually go on to coating the piece, which is that layers of coat uh, are finished. Back a minute ago, you had gloves on, and you were, were those sanding gloves? Uh, the, no. You had gloves on. Oh, Home Depot gloves, we got the fingers on. <laughs> <laughs> but it had sandpaper on the sand, if you saw the sandpaper. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't. Yeah, well, yeah, we, we usually just take gloves. They have to be flexible enough to even move them pretty well, but we'll usually cut the fingertips off of all of them because if you're picking up little screws or what a feel, Thing. You can't do it with big gloves on, so you got to go feel it. You can feel the heat build up too, and that's one thing you can punish yourself. How long a time when you go this? How long does that take? To what actually cut the wood down? Um, well, the roughing stage takes longer because you're starting out with a log, and after you have to get it round and then do the whole section, you're removing a lot of wood. Couple and hours. I hollow it out. Yep, this could take an hour or two, or a day. Big ones, giant things. Giant ones could take all day long or more. But once you've got it hollowed out, it's been cured and dried. You're just thinning. Just you're just making the final cut. So that is much faster. Maybe 20 minutes, you'll get get that final little cut done. In a very early slide, you showed how the the log is screwed attached to this device in order to put it onto the lathe. And I say, see it still here in the finishing stage. Do you do some special treatment once you detach that device? The, the face plug, yeah. It is bolted on there, so um, um, some pieces are, are yes, it, the, the plate is attached to it and the screws are removed. We fill the holes and then- so That's at the end, I think, are you asking, how long we keep it? What do we, do? Yeah. we do a group. We don't just do one bowl all the way through. You know, we'll rough it and dry it. We don't just do it in groups. So you got constantly starting, constantly finishing. And we do a group. We'll do 15 at a time. But every one, except when we rough them, we'll do a face plate. One face plate. Once it's rough, we take it off and this goes up. But once they're dry, we'll pull our 15 out that we're going to finish. Put 15 plates. And that plate stays on until it's polished, until it looks just like that. And the last stage is to pull that plate off. Gotcha. You don't want to take that off because that's holding it perfectly in, in rounds. So. I was going to say, how do you, you have to keep it centered from the rough stage to the final stage. How do you take it from the rough stage and make sure that you get it centered when you do the final stage? Well, you, you kind of, you place this, usually if, if they haven't warped much, you place this the face plate right in the center of that base that you've turned. And that should actually put out there. And you can be off this much, but that's okay because you still left it this thick. Okay. But if you're if it's bouncing back and forth this much, you need to go back and remeasure using measurements 
to get it exactly on so that you're not off more than a quarter of an inch. How long does time does it take to do this wonderful shot? Well, start to finish can take, uh, depending on the size and what kind of wood it is, uh, maybe eight weeks to a year, can take more than a year. On big pieces, they just, and we're not working on it the whole time, but it's, it's being either treated or dried, and big pieces can take four or five months to dry out. So. Some pieces take up to five years. For perspective, how many do you uh, finish in one year? A hundred. A hundred, a hundred twenty, like that. And, but they're not all like big like this big piece here, you know. There's some of them this big and some of them, most of them are in the size like this range here, you know. But we'll do some this and several of them this big. And to put that in perspective, a glass blower will do, you know, 5,000 pieces in a year and painters will paint, I don't know. A hundred paintings and they do a thousand friends. What is that material you're putting on there? This is applying to finish. What is that? And this is after it's all all been thinned down. It's gone through this whole sanding sanding stage where it's really smooth. And you know we'll, we'll get a thinner coat to start with, and it's an epoxy type of finish. So it's mixed up, and it doesn't really dry. This actually chemically sets, but. Uh, what we're doing, what he's doing, he, this is actually after the, it's had like two thinner coats on before this, but, but once we have a couple thin coats underneath, then we start putting thick coats on there, and each one's got to be put on there, and it takes a day or so for this to set up enough so you can start working on it again, re-sand it, and then re-coat it again, so it's got two or three of these final coats on there. And the torch was just to, to warm it up so it, it goes? It, it removes the air bubbles out because when it's mixed up, this oh. is not like water. This is like uh, honey or something. It's really thick. The bubbles out. And they're tiny little bubbles again. If you do that, they all, they'll come to the We same. have like eight to ten coats. And so it's not, it's, the first coat is, is like water. It's very, very thin. The second, final coat's like molasses. Very, very thick. And so um, we can't, the torch is, yeah, it's, it has nothing to do with the, um, Reactivity of the finish is just to do with air bubbles, but we can't get the wood hot or the finish. <laughs> Since the color is uh, goes up the trunk, will you make bowls that are very similar because of that? Uh, if they're if they're next to each other in that log, they're going to be similar looking, but they won't be identical. Uh, and even somewhere you might have. Log this long, and here's the bottom bowl, and it's sitting upright, same way the tree grew. Well, you can do another bowl right above it where the actual opening is facing down, so the two tops would almost be book match. But they still won't be exactly the same. I mean, no tree is perfectly symmetrical, where all the patterns are exactly the same. What are your favorite woods? I have a least favorite dogwood. <laughs> dogwood is one of the hardest woods in North America. Um, it is extremely dense, um, and it's, uh, it's a real punishment. I don't do many in a year. Um, and it, the description on how big it gets, um, but it, it is it is extremely um, difficult. It's uh, it's kind of a gray pink, but I, I typically maybe do one every two years. Um, but that's probably my least favorite. Favorite woods, I don't really have I'd say. Ma maples are really good. We use uh, silver maple, we use red maple, and then ash leaf maple. And they, the ash leaf is softer than the other two, but the other ones are not really hard, just really hard. They're easy, they're harder, but they cut real cleanly, but they're not the shorter to cut. And, so, and they vary in their patterns a lot. So we use a lot of those because they grow in the southeast so much. If, if you when you're doing rough turning and you come across a gap either caused by a fungus or, or some internal growth, what do you do with that? Uh, I, mean, it, I mean, some bowls that I've seen have, you know, open spaces in the lower part of it. Right. I mean, like a natural void? Right. Yeah, a void. Um, it's, It'll be incorporated if it's if the wood is spectacular enough to be finished. Then it'll be incorporated. We'll remove a section from that another part of the tree and put it in there, and then cut it flush. But it would have to be pretty exceptional to um, uh, to go to that trouble, uh, you know, to, to incorporate that. You find burls sometimes have this problem a lot because they have bark 
going in and out. And as you, even as you turn it, you'll end up with these, all these places around it. And we'll save all the dust with, with, with sanding and mix it in with the bark to get in that. You know, but if it's too big, you don't want an area, of, say, this big, that's just purely filled in because it's all plain and it does, that doesn't look natural. It needs to have some texture. So we'll try to find the same bark off the same logs to go in that, that spot. Now, the burl is a cancer growth on a tree. Uh, burl is used in the commercial wood industry. They've been near it for um, car paneling and boats and stuff like that. So really, that's the wood you see. It's real you know, highly figured to burl. How did you decide to do the lustrous finish versus a more natural finish? Your family, I assume, decided at some point. Well, this is something my, my father came up with, with using this finish. And one thing about this is kind of all optically clear. And it, you can see right down to the grain of the wood. Whereas if you use like an oil finish, it's a lot dull, more dull. You don't get the colors. This brings all the colors out. You can just see it so well. We've advanced it a great deal from his original formula. Um, now we've almost essentially mastered the finish, and so it's been it's highly versatile because wood moves, and sometimes other finishes that are um, have a hard coat they, they can crack, and so this one can actually bleed with the wood, so it has an elasticity to it, um, and we have to be conscious of that. We can control how hard the finish is, how soft it is, how quick it cures, how thick it is, and so it's. Uh, we inadvertently developed a lot of science about the, our chemistry on the finish and the science of the wood properties too. So, but it, it's, but it's also, not so it also you have to, it's not, you can't just mix up like a gallon and do all your pieces at one time. <laughs> this re starts reacting fast and, and these curing times uh, is something that you always have to keep in mind because uh, is it, if there's heat outside, it'll develop its own heat as it's doing this, but if you have a heated room, you're doing this, it's gonna go three or four times faster. So there's an optimum temperature to do this at, and so like when it's really hot outside, you gotta have air conditioner running in order to still keep up a 10, like a 10 minute work time. But in the winter time, the opposite is true. If you don't have it warm enough, it never gets thin enough to mix well. And so that, that's a real problem. So uh, we have to, know all this and work with it so that you don't have problems. Well, we're going to preview through the pieces real quick that we brought here that were created just for you guys, Spring Island. And so this is one of my father's pieces from the Spring Island Tulip Poplar. How big is that? How tall is that, man? It's probably about this big. How big? Is it that piece there? Yeah. I don't know. So this is called yellow cucumber magnolia. It's one of the rarest forms of magnolia in the world. Um, it grew at Gould's Corner in Augusta, planted by the Berkmans, who sold the land to Bobby Jones for Augusta National. The family that owned the parcel sent us the whole tree. We um, did several pieces from it, and um, uh, we'd never even heard of the tree when they sent it to us, but it was uh, spectacular to be able to create something. Um, and. They later, this was the biggest tree in Georgia. It was a national champion, which in trees there's a champion series. Um, uh, so if you think you have the largest tree um, of that species, check the registry. <coughs> you won't believe how big trees can get. And so, um, but they have they rate them as, as national champions, or they have by state champion and national. Um, uh, nationally, it's not real relevant because a, a live oak in, in this area would be, you know, much bigger than a live oak in, say, Texas. So, um, but anyway, so this is Magnolia cordata. They've since changed the name scientifically to Magnolia accumulata. And so, but it's yellow cucumber magnolia is a common name. This is silver maple. Uh, and most silver maples are going to be pure white. They're going to look like this the whole way through. And uh, as they age, sometimes you'll get little black lines. It looks like somebody took a, like an artist's pen and took India ink and made little lines. But this color here actually developed while the tree was growing. And they don't all have this. So when you find one of these starburst patterns, these are just terrific to turn. And one thing that you'll go, these little spots here, those are wormholes. And that's one of the characteristics of these maple, red maple, ashley's maple, and these. They have these little bitty worms that'll get in there and make these holes. And that, sometimes that brings in some of the things that make, causes the color in the wood. But that's one way you, when you're looking at these woods, if you see those, you know you got a maple. So. And this tree was turned on axis, and that's part of the artistry of what we do. So is we are revealing the pattern 
And um, when I mean turned on axis, the tree grew vertically, the piece was created in a vertical fashion. We can, and across the generations, you'll, my grandfather only turned on axis, you know, and he used a very uh, simple pallet of wood uh, from southeastern trees, where we've expanded well beyond that. We have a, our varietal is much larger now, and we turn on any axis, and so it's get a different effect, and you'll see, um, like this is, I don't know what on this. Yeah, yeah. so you're on top of it. So, and we didn't know what they would look like when we got the wood from you guys, so it was kind of fun to just try our best. Mm -hmm. The black piece is on the left hand side. So what, and what colors there are? You guess only one of the colors. Is <laughs> that, that black section of... Right here? No. 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 Oh, good luck. Right here? No. Spot. This white spot right in here? Yes. That's a bark inclusion. Oh, that's probably a bark inclusion or something that was in the tree. That was a wound in the tree. As this so. as this thing aged after we had the wood or after the tree was cut somewhere, this thing began to age. And when they start aging, they don't stay exactly the same as when it's cut. All of a sudden, you start getting different colorations. So mm -hmm. Spots of color, and one might be real light like that spot up there, and then the rest of it is dark or patches of, of these different colors. Uh, and, and that's an Ashley maple. That's Ashley's maple. This is you saw the silver maple. Here's a little spot. Here's a little worm on the Ashley maple. So. Talk about the red color. Uh, the red color is caused by a bacteria that lives in the tree, and it doesn't hurt the tree. And if you see one of these trees growing, you can't tell it has red in it. The only way to tell is you just bore a hole in it or see it cut down. Then you'll see this pattern on the end of the log. And most of the ones that we find that have the red, good red color, they all grow near river bottoms and creeks where it's really moist. You don't, up in dry areas, you don't see much of the red. And not everyone has red. Most of them are just butter white. That's the, the most common you find the tree. Did you enjoy the spring wood that you got? Yes. another popper. This is these are turned sideways. What are you tell the way the patterns are running? More horizontal. Straight is going that way. That's the growth pattern. So it's almost quarter saw. I think the quarter saw beam. <laughs> now some some of the bowls, and I can't remember which one, but if you look at them from the top, you'll see the rings, you know, circular like you might expect to see when you see a pine cut down, you'll see the rings, and you can actually see them in some of the some of the logs, the rings are so faint you don't it's hard to see even when they're there. But they're not in what when we were doing this, if it's a big enough log, we may not use the whole log, we may cut a circle off. August, they will kind of circle out here, and you won't see all the rings. You'll just see partials. So we may get three bowls out of one section. So depending on how it's turned and everything else, that the ring, actual annual rings are going to appear different. In turning, it's rhythmic because it's spinning. So you can hear the wood as it's changing because it had. It, it, when you cut and thin down the walls, it has a different sound to it, and um, you can hear cracks developing. You can hear the wood straining, and so. Um, you try to be conscious of that, and so that's one of the um, uh, the elements to it. Because people want to know how thin. How do you know if you thin too far, or try not to cut through the sides of a hollow form? And it, a lot of it becomes instinct after a while. When I first started learning, I would just cut through pieces all the time. That's just part of the, you know, the, the elementary side. Of it. This is this is a red maple, and we kind of kind of a. Is a common name or leopard metal because it has this, the spots in there like a leopard. But this is the other kind of wood we like to use a lot because if you find these spots, here's some wormholes again, you know, it's kind of indicative. Like this one has all of the spark, starburst patterns. So this can be turned vertically, so this is growing just like a tree grew, but it could have been turned sideways too, and all the things would run around the sides. Red maple, Acer rubrum, has a fire red leaf in the fall. That would be the easiest way to identify it. All right, next one. This is a mo this oh is a, this is a mosaic series my did my father created that was um, uh, wholly unique to his kind of direction of work. 
Right, yeah, this is, obviously, you can tell this is made up of multiple pieces of different types of trees. So what I've actually done here is take a round, kind of cylinder-shaped form, and for one this size, like a five-gallon pail, because it's fairly uniform, and I cut all these sections as the height of the pail, and I put them in the pail in the order that I want them to appear on this outside of this bowl. So I'm cutting all these, and right, the red cedar here, I have probably five pieces going around the side, kind of spaced out, and then the yellow mahonia is spaced around and different, and, but I keep putting these pieces into those full of these pieces, it's very tight. And then I pour this resin in here, and it's darkened with carbon black, because carbon black is a color that actually appears in nature, but it doesn't compete with wood color. So if you use a brown mixture, you kind of take away from all the other wood in here. So the black is just as a background to highlight the wood. And so once this thing hardens, I pull the form off and I have this solid cylinder and I just treat it just like it's a log. So it goes on the way to the face plate and I shape the whole outside and hollow the inside out and we'll end up with this. Is done. Is it a similar technique? Of well, segmented is a little different than what what I do. The seg most of what we consider segment is you're creating a pattern, and a lot of times it can be very intricate. Now. So somebody will get out there with like graph paper and they'll draw out what they want and where these are going to appear, and then they'll get on their saw and they have to cut perfect angles to get all these pieces in place to glue it all together. And so they'll cut it, you know, but it'll still be, you know, be thick, this thick, it won't be, but they'll have to be, the angles have to be really right on. They glue it together and then when they turn it, then you'll get also like a woven basket. It can look like, oh, just like, mm -hmm. amazing. We, we don't do any segmentation no, or anything. No, but I was just um, wondering a little bit. <laughs> very tedious. Very you common. have to, you know, if you like detail or if you're an accountant, you'd probably like to do <laughs> But this, this is essentially um, abstract segmentation. Yeah. Um, black walnut, everyone knows that as a furniture wood. And so I put, I put a stripe of the sapwood, which is the outer layer, to the bark included. It's blonde. Um, but uh, it's, it's a sapwood. It is sideways, so this was the fork in the tree. And so you can see the stress, what's called, uh, in the center here, when you see depth in wood, it's called shadowing. And it's, uh, it's where the stress of that growth uh, mirrors into the wood tissue. And uh, it's, you can get entire, you know, strips of wood like that um, uh, where a tree's grown under that kind of duress. But this one is just a glimpse of it captured through the sculpture. But yeah, black walnut is very common for furniture. I mean, most people know that, but this is what it looks like when you look with it. Now this one, if you, in, in pieces that are similarly turned or the side with, if you look on this side, you'll see the rings this way. If you go on the other side, you'll see them the same thing because you're looking at two different sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was a red maple from your island. Uh, so that was probably one of the best pieces that came out. Uh, it was almost marble, but it had developed a uh, fantastic um, uh, kind of spalting and um, uh, coloration was, was you know uh, forming within the log. What size is it? 12, 14 inch diameter. Um, Anyone familiar or heard of the term called spalting? No, about spalting. Okay. So, so spalting um, is decay in wood. Um, so when a tree dies, um, half berries, maples, oaks, they can be healthy and they have clean wood with no color. As the decomposition begins, the fault lines, in a sense, can turn black and discolor but the structure of the wood's still there. And the best way I like to describe that is um, we try to capture that moment. And it didn't exist while the tree was alive, and then once the tree decomposes, it doesn't have enough structural integrity to create a sculpture from it. So you've captured that moment in time. Think of black and white photography. You photographed the moment. It wasn't, did not exist before, it didn't exist afterwards. And so we've frozen this decomposition um, permanently. And that's what sculpting is. Sometimes the, the spalking 
softens the wood quite a bit in some places. Is, it, it's is, too is far that a problem yeah. for, for turning? If you capture spalting at the right moment, it's not. It can be it's still be very hard, very it yeah, very good integrity. But if you go too long, yes, it gets too soft, and then if it gets way too soft, it's just and it doesn't work. more more trouble to work with. There's it's worthwhile. You, you capture the optimal moment. You mm -hmm. capture the sunrise because it it is it has come. That color has been interjected into that right. into the um, mm -hmm. the cells of the wood. Yet it still um, has its density. Uh, now a lot of most of the spalling I've seen is wasn't like that, it was lines. You know, interesting lines going on. It can on. manifest in different ways. It can be little, like, pink lines. It can be in, where you have patches of black, white, reddish, I mean, just all over the place. Yeah. Uh, it can be like in little, almost like little irregular circles of black lines instead of just straight lines. It just be so if, if you had one that just had lines in it and you turned it, would it just be little dots? Or how would it show uh, up? No, usually it looks like they run over the top because they they ran out and actually at the end of the log they just they don't look like they're going out like spider things out this way. But when you curve it, rather than going out, they follow the curve, so they go all the way down the sides and they you don't actually see the end of most of those little black lines. That's right. part of the fungus. It, it's a fungus, I guess. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's part of the artistry is capturing that you're revealing a pattern that uh, that doesn't that wasn't. That exist inside there, and some some woods fall better than others. Um, there's um, some woods fall under better conditions. Um, certain species fall, some don't. A lot of your fruit woods don't fall. Your cherries, um, apples, peach, uh, they don't really fall. Uh, I'm trying to think, walnut doesn't fall. Sometimes sapwood can fall on certain woods, but to fall all the way to the center, you know, your maples and hackberries do the best. Cedar. Cedar does not fall. Not, the white outer part came a little bit, but the red center is never. Probably the sapwood. Yeah, just anything in the conifer family would do it. You cut a series of these? How do you capture the moment? It's um, a good question. So it is sold to us with the pre existing condition ready to develop, and we know that. Um, or it's sold to us in, in that state, and it's solid. Okay. If it's brought to us, um, as a specimen, you know, more like a commission. Someone brought me a hackberry tree. Mm -hmm. They want it. Um, we'll monitor it and take slices off the end and watch it as mm -hmm. it develops. You'll, you'll see it on the end of the log. It's not like you have to guess where it is. You, you can. If the end, end gets too dried out, you can cut off a half inch. You'll see if there are patterns there, and you can take like a screwdriver or maybe a knife, and you can poke it. It's still hard, even though the black lines are developing. It's still that's. Fine. You just watch it. You know, every every week, check it because you don't want to get soft, too soft to work. How do you two work together? I, I had a little we sense. I get. I, I, this is fascinating. Do you all view yourself as individual artists? What level of collaboration? It sounds like. This is my piece, this is your dad's piece. We're completely independent. Our work, we work independently in different studios. Um, we, we share material because it gets sourced the same way. Um, but other than that, we, we are on our own schedules. Um, we show in galleries around the country together. He, he has his own style, and I kind of turn, but if you see enough of ours, you'll you can build, pick them out. Right define that a little bit. Well, I kind of define mine as if I'm doing a round shape, Mine's going to be round and kind of a lifted base, so it's going to somewhere. Even if it's elliptical and low, it's probably going to lift up a little bit more. And when you look at something my father used to do, his would come out in more like a, like a tire shape, so it's kind of more squared on um, most of his. You kind of you'll see that. Too. So it's um, with, there's a certain center of gravity on the pieces. If you really study the work across the generations it's 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 obvious and evident i mean um think of handwriting between gener generations i mean it's not going to be the same father son to grandson i mean brush strokes within painting families it's different and so um and then there's other things that are quite obvious um with my grandfather um his finishes were different and we have to be conscious of that on restorations because that's um one of the factors the curators have expressed to us you, we can't we can use some of our modern techniques for it but we have to restore it to a, a certain historical integrity 
um, and that's that's obvious and evident within those works. Um, now we don't control each other's you know design or anything like that. We do collaborate on technical issues. So if we have a tool issues or machine issues, or he says, "Hey, I've got this new thing on this finish. This will work better than this," or I just got found this tool that will clean this inside a lot better than what we're using now. So we need to get one like this. And we'll do that a lot. We did a, um, a very large public art show. Um, it's in Phoenix at the Desert Botanical Gardens. And we did a series just out of desert trees, or indigenous Arizona. Runs from February till May. And um, we, uh, in that situation, we had to share material because it was, it, was, it was being brought in from the, the Southwest. And so in, in that sense, we didn't collaborate per se on an individual piece, but we had to, um, we had to divide material up kind of evenly. It wasn't because it wasn't uh, it was scarce in a sense. I'm sorry for this, but uh, was it fair to say that you learned from your father? Something. <laughs> 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 okay. No, no. It's, he I learned I, more from Ed. He really did. I, I learned probably from my grandfather just because of the age and timing. I, you know, he, he was an elder in his career, and I spent a lot of time with him. And, there were five grandchildren. He taught all the grandkids kind of the, the, the basics to this. And I was the only one that had a lot of interest, but there was some innate ability. And he kept pushing it at the interest. And um, I wasn't showing or selling work. He was just utilizing me in his studio. <laughs> and I have an example of spalting. This is magna, uh, poplar from Spring Island. It has a uh, ebony kind of heart with a violet. But that's a quarter of the tree. Um, and then spalting is the next one, and this is the the bluff oak, which is kind of your rare oak. You guys have one of the largest diversity of oaks um, anywhere in the world here, so it's kind of, uh, it's really neat. This is the first time I've ever touched bluff oak before. I had to look it up. It was <laughs> yes? You talk about restoration. Uh, over 30 or 40 years, how likely is a bowl to crack? Zero. But p p things get mistreated and mishandled. I mean, we've had moisture issues in the basement of a museum before. I mean, uh, a well, lot of times. Part, to be fair, it could crack. It depends on you know, the conditions. You know, if it goes from kind of a, a higher moisture content and then it gets into really dry, wood will move forever. It doesn't just freeze and never move. You watch old furniture tables and stuff. You'll where the legs join and stuff, you'll see the cracks yeah. with it, depending on the wood. Yeah. And these will move too, you know. But they shouldn't, if they're dried well, they shouldn't. I mean, they're not going to pop open. I, I fix pieces for people sometimes, and they'll say, oh, well, it dried, it popped open. I said, well, how big is the crack? They said, well, it's just a little, you can hardly see it go to the other side. And I said, well, that didn't shrink. Somebody probably dropped it. They said, well, I didn't drop it. So it could have been hit and cracked with a hairline and you'd never see it for, it could be two years before you noticed it. So they let, we don't have shrinkage sh cracks or never had really been a problem. They climatize work when they ship it for exhibitions. That's one of the factors and that's true for this. And one of the times we've seen a lot of damage is, is usually negligence through generations. Parents acquire objects, they don't tell their kids and then they get it and they destroy it and then it gets back into our studio. <laughs> but, and then in the final slide, you can see this is a, kind of a point of view. That's a piece of woods called cherry laurel, which is the evergreen cherry. Um, Carolina cherry is the other name for it. Um, but it's just a, a rough form to give you an idea. Yes, what it looks like the Turner's view of it. So. Our vantage point from uh, our odd equipment. Yeah. Any other questions? I hate to ask you if you um, use stain on any of these pieces. They're no all their natural. One, one variety of tree seems to yeah. produce so many different colors. But that's all within the trees. Everything down to the bare wood. Now, the example. See, that's so light that, that, that just putting epoxy on it, it would ch turn darker. Uh, so, in the cherry families, they oxidize. And so, uh -huh. meaning that right. when the pH, the wood gets exposed, the element it darkens over time. And so, we, we now have to, um, or he, he developed a method that would naturally do that. Um, some woods oxidize light to dark, some reverse oxidized, dark to light. Black walnut goes from a really jet black to a coffee cream color. Cherry start, cherry mahogany, um, African sumac, they start out kind of pink salmon color and they age to a real rose red. Uh, we can control those factors if we want to. But in terms of like a, a stain is a, that's not a natural reaction with the wood. That's all we would ever 
kind of in a new case. It's hard, it's hard, at least from my standpoint, because you know, I've played around with some of these, you can't find a color that looks as good as natural colors, and you just can't do it. And when you try to, you know, I'll try to put some brown in here, a red to go along and make more red in there, you know, it stand out. It just doesn't look right. So don't, don't mess with Mother Nature. I mean, it really is. <laughs> Keep with the natural. You know. Yes. I, I think Dan said it best when he introduced you, and that is the three generations of your family have been a gift to uh, craft and art in the United States. And we are very honored to have you here and to have you at work this spring. I really thank you so much. <laughs> Two-year-old. <laughs> 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 <laughs>